might be easy to us. So our goal then is obviously to choose any of those two. And let's say we go pick the AD interaction. So here's my first five coefficients A, B, C, D, E. Let me choose as my next coefficients to estimate the stress model the AD. Run more experiments. Run more experiments. Okay. 
Okay, so, so that takes me down in this table to another row. Absolutely, that's one option. Is there another option that's available to you? Without having to run the word
if we are to estimate B, what's it going to be A distance? B is going to be A distance with CD, and that's the only other two factor interaction. What is C going to be A distance with? What is D a list with? It is BC. And E is a list with AC. Do any of the two factor interactions that I'm interested in appear up there? I don't have an AD here. I don't have a BC. Oh, do you have BC? Okay. So BC is alias with D. So we're stuck again. But let's take a look at that carefully. D is the effect of windows in your car, is alias with BC. BC is the effect of tire pressure wrapped up with or interacting with the weight in your car. You may simply make a decision at this point I'm willing to forego either estimating D or BC. Or simply you're going to estimate a coefficient at that point and not be able to tell if it's due to BC or due to D. Eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't clearly estimate one of your two factor interactions. But so far, this design is less bad than the previous one because the previous one, all, all my two factor interactions were tied up. This one, so far, I've only got one that I'm unable to estimate. AD and B and DE don't appear in that list. So if they don't appear in that list, we can actually estimate them as my coefficients number six and seven. So let's give that a try. There's AD and DE. What are AD and DE areas with respect to? interaction there, nothing there, simply BE. Okay, so AD and BE. BE, is that a useful interaction? Is that likely going to be significant? Yeah. Tire pressure and speed on fuel efficiency. Does the fuel efficiency change when you're driving at low pressure tires, low speed or higher speed? Is that going to have more or less an effect on fuel efficiency than driving with your windows open and the air conditioner on? Okay, so AD plus BE, at that point it gets a confounding but you might make an engineering judgment that tire pressure and speed don't matter too much as an interaction. And that that effect is going to be dominated by AD. This is exactly the cost that we pay by doing fewer experiments. Doing fewer experiments means we're always going to run the risk of making some sort of judgment call here that may or may not be accurate. But I'm going to argue in a minute that it's not a bad thing. It's better than being totally uneducated and just taking a random guess. And it's better than doing all two to the five experiments and blowing your entire budget only to find after the fact that it's not important. Okay, so it's a good compromise. And at least we're going into it with our eyes wide open and very clear of what's going on. Let's just quickly do the last one, DE. What's its interaction? Uh, so what's its agency? So tire pressure and air conditioning, those two definitely are going to interact. Okay? So that's actually a great term that we can estimate quite clearly. So this is exactly why we, we do the 
into the aliasing and the dividing relationships ahead of time. And it's why when I work with companies, we spend about four to five hours planning our experiment before we even run the experiment. Because we go through multiple permutations of this assignment of the So We go into the same, apart from the five main effects, we expect some two-factor interactions based on our engineering judgments. And that goes to that should, yeah. Experiments, but then there's, they have different problems associated with them. We don't cover those in this course. But one topic that we're going to see next is we're going to be able to then say, look, if we see that there's a problem with this experiment, I can go choose a mirror image of the fractional factorial to unconfound this, this problem. So this leads into a discussion there. What have you noticed is that main effects, A, B, C, D, E, are confounded with two-factor interactions in this experiment. This all comes down to what we call resolution. Seeing that main effects are confounded with two-factor interactions, we could actually have told that ahead of time without even generating those, uh, sorry, without even writing out the defining relationship. And the way you do that is by using this Roman numeral subscript. Take a look at this. This is a 2 to the 5 minus 2 subscript 3. And one way you can interpret that 3 is let main effects equal 1, let 2 factor interactions 2, and let 3 factor interactions equal 3. And what you say then is that the resolution 3 design. Or another way of saying that 3 is 2 plus 1, indicating that main effects given to you by a 1 are confounded with two-factor interactions given to you by a 2. If we had a resolution 4 design, a resolution 4 design, IV, means that main effects are going to be confounded with only three-factor interactions. That's a far more powerful design because three-factor interactions are almost always not significant. So for main effects to be confounded with three-factor interactions may be pretty good. We don't ever have this problem where an important two-factor interaction gets wrapped up into our main effect. A resolution 4 design also means that two-factor interactions are only confounded with other two-factor interactions. Whereas in a resolution 3 design, we saw two-factor interactions are confounded with main effects. Main effects are almost always significant. Right? We expect main effects to be significant because after all, that's why it's a main effect. We've chosen it to be a variable. And we've usually got good reason for doing that. But in a resolution 4 design, we get greater resolution or greater ability to separate our main effects from two-factor interactions. Because in a resolution 4 design, our main effects are never tied up to two-factor interactions. They're only tied up to three and higher interactions. Okay, so this, this rule then helps us resolve our design. There's also resolution 5 designs. These are designs where main effects are only confounded with four-factor interactions, two-factor interactions are only confounded with three-factor interactions, and then five-factor So we definitely like higher resolution designs, but what you'll notice is that your higher resolution designs appear all the way on the left-hand side of the table. And that left-hand side of the table is where I mentioned to you is where you don't really want to be. You want to be over on the right-hand side the right hand side allows you to include as many factors as possible. So here's, here's your approach to experimenting when you go in the, in the future. 
your approach to experimenting, as, as I've believed this course, should always be the following. Always start with a low resolution design and then move your way up. So in an initial design where you've got no idea, it's the first time you're looking at the system. This is the systems that you all face in your course projects. They should all be resolution three designs pretty much. Where you've got no idea of what's going on, you want to just screen your initial variables to find out whether they're actually important or not. Once you have done that, you can go up to a resolution four design and then resolution five designs are only really used when you want to create a high fidelity so you typically won't pay for a resolution 5 design right out of, out of the start of the process. So let me take a look at, at an example. Here's an example in the notes. And this example, in fact, is based on a company that's troubleshooting. What happened is this company built a second plant in another location. <coughs> And their second plant had significant problems. It had problems with their filtration. So this company treats, treats the water stream. Once they treated it at the new location, their filtration times at the new location were almost double than what they were before. Much, much higher. And they're trying to figure out what is the cause of the longer filtration times. So longer times are not desirable. You want short times. So let's take a look. What they did was they put seven variables to the test. So this is exactly right, what they should be doing. They want to calculate and find out which factors affect the process with as few experiments as possible. And what they did was they identified seven variables. There's a big meeting. Everyone comes in and throws their suggestion. And instead of simply saying, the engineers dominate the discussion, saying, I think it's this, and someone else saying, I think it's that. We'll take everyone's opinion into account, and let's do a fractional factorial that is very saturated, so a resolution we design. So A is temperature that they run the filter press at. B was the type of raw material that they were processing. So the raw material was either um, A or B, uh, sorry, one type or another type. So it's a kind of article variable. C is whether they add caustic soda or not to the filter press. D was whether they use recycle or not. So they could turn off the recycle loop. So maybe on longer filtration times, because there's a recycle or there's not a recycle. E was Pressure, lower pressure or a higher pressure that they were operating the filter press at. E. F was whether they were using a new or old filter cloth. And factor G was an interesting one because the new the new plant was built further away from the original one, the source of water was a little bit different. So G was whether they used city water or well water. So this is actually a very smart way of proceeding because instead of telling people around the meeting table your idea that temperature affects the process is wrong, telling the chemists that your theory about caustic soda is rubbish, well, we can incorporate it. Like we're going to do eight experiments, we can incorporate up to seven variables and test everyone's theory. Um, Right, it might be that the well water contains extra salts or iron, 
components that are then creating a formulation effect and clogging up the filter path. So this screening experiment is literally just to identify which variables should I spend my time investing in. Right? We're not saying, we're not going to find out all the interactions and the combinations. This is literally just an experiment to find where we should focus our energy. And we can do this in a few number of experiments, and that is eight experiments. So a great way to start, and that's exactly the, the reasoning here, is we're starting with a resolution three design, so we can screen many factors. You should always start with this type of design when you're doing and developing a new product, and culture, and process, or when you're trying to scale up the process, transfer from the lab to the plant. This is a great place to start your experiment for the resolution three. So we can go build this model. It's a, we've got seven coefficients, eight experiments. If we go to the table, we can locate where we are and yeah, which type of experiment is this. Where are we on the screen? Two to the seven minus four. This is the most saturated design that you can have. So the experiment was generated using those combinations over there. You can see that and verify it there. And when you do the analysis, what do we find? What are the most important factors that you put us? Our C, A, and G. So temperature is important, caustic soda is important, and that city water is important. So C, A, and G. E, F, D, and B, they can be forgotten about. So three factors are important, four factors are unimportant. If three factors are important, what's a full factorial in three factors? It's eight experiments. How many experiments did we run? Eight. So in fact, we recover our full factorial over there. If you only consider C, A, and G, you've already done a full factorial of three factors. You're not doing any more extra work. Your original work you've done is already good enough for that. Okay. Let's say that you wanted to actually E factor E or E in for a minute. So let's say C, A, G, and E are considered significant. So now you've got four factors. Four factors is how many experiments? We only did eight. So four factors, six, eight experiments. That would put us over here. So notice that we don't go do any more work by simply deciding we're going to drop three factors out. Simply moves us to this point over here. What has that done is it's taken us from a resolution three design to a resolution four design. So the moment you decide you're going to drop out factor F, D, and B and retain those first four, you now automatically get the resolution for design. You don't have to go recalculate anything. The main effects, the coefficients, all of that stays the same. And you prove that in the last assignment as well for yourself. Because that matrix X transpose X is orthogonal, when you go recalculate it, the coefficients you calculate are identical to the first time around. So we, we can simply proceed by then using those four, four factors in the eight experiments and we now have a half fraction we can go analyze. Okay, so that's that's the approach that, that we follow. How do you ask there about fewer experiments? Yes. We don't cover it in this course, but I do recommend, especially the 600 level students, please go look up types of Berman, Berman, Berman designs and box and this guy's paper on the 12 experiments you can find out. These, two, these types of experiments are actually very useful um, in practice. I've, I've often used these because we often get situations where a company has um, four pieces of equipment. It's kind of interesting how companies tend to do this because when they buy stuff for the lab, they buy them in groups, they always seem to have an even number of equipment. 
So if you're able to run 12, 16, 20 experiments, often 20 experiments means you run um, five pieces of equipment four times. So you can often generate um, nice experimental designs for these by the number of experiments. So we're not constrained to the power of two. We can run experiments that are sort of multiples of four, um, but they they have a slightly different structure and a slightly different data analysis that we won't cover. There is uh, one other topic I do want to cover, and that was one I had skipped over right near the start. Um, I think it's right back at slides. temperature, 
might put a column for driver, you might put a column for traffic, and those get recorded next to your data. So the first experiment might be minus, 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 temperature outside, 24. The driver is me. The next experiment is plus, minus, minus, the temperature outside is 21 degrees, and the driver might be someone else. So you record the covariance. So many times when I've worked with these data is after the fact when we're doing the analysis, we discover something that's a little bit unusual about the data, and we come back to the covariance and we can find the reason for it in the covariance. Covariance are some of the most important things that you can do when you're running your experiment is record absolutely everything that you can think of that's measurable. Anything that's measurable to your mind, you're not necessarily controlling it. If you, can, if you can measure it in some way, you should record it there for later use during the data analysis. Okay, let's talk about this the next one over here. If you cannot measure it and you cannot control it. So a good example of this might be your engine. time, the engine efficiency might have that sort of trend. Absolutely your engine efficiency affects your gas mileage. But without doing anything about it, you cannot measure your engine's efficiency. But every experiment that you run, every subsequent experiment has slightly lower and lower and lower energy. Uh, engine efficiency. What's the problem with that? Provides the results. So let's take a look at this. One of the worst things that you can do is Remember how we set up our experimental table? Minus, plus, minus, plus. This last column C, remember, is minus, minus, plus, 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 plus. Let's say we're doing a full factorial. And let's say factor C, if you ran your experiments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in that order on the table, notice that factor C is going to be correlated with engine and in fact to see, maybe fact to see really actually has no effect on the fuel efficiency. Let's presume it's a factor that you chose, but it really actually has no effect on fuel efficiency. If you go run this experiment in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you're going to pick up that fuel efficiency through fact to see. So you're going to pick up that fact to see is significant, even though fact to see is not significant. You're going to come to the wrong conclusion. This, everyone, pretty much every one of you in the room has this problem in your experiments. Several of you suggested doing experiments like shooting a basketball or baking recipes. Every time you bake a recipe, you get better and better at doing it. Your, your process changes and improves. A few of you were suggesting experiments where you're working out in the gym. Your body is naturally improving over those successive experiments. There's always some unmeasured, so unmeasured and uncontrolled change occurring in your system over time. There always is. Okay. So what can you do to counteract it? There's only one thing you can do, and that's to randomize the data, uh, to randomize the order of the experiments. If you run your experiments in random order, to prevent any of these factors here that we just call disturbances. So I could be a little bit more specific. These are unmeasured, uncontrolled disturbances. That's the only reason why we randomize our experiments, so that unmeasured, uncontrolled disturbances have no effect on your heart variable. 
the last one is a little bit more subtle. These are me measurements that you cannot estimate or measure in some way, but you can control them. Okay. By that I mean, for example, road conditions. If you're driving your car, the road conditions. You cannot estimate what the road conditions are on your car, what, the, what they'll have as their effect on the gas mileage. But they're controllable in some way. Because if you go do, let's say, four experiments on one day and four experiments on the next day, and it happens that the first day the road is slightly wet and the next day the road is dry, you've got four experiments and four experiments. You, could, you can choose how you allocate those runs. You've got some control over how you allocate those four experiments versus the next four experiments. But you don't know the effect of what that road conditions are on your car. Another example is if you're baking recipes for your course project. And you buy enough flour, let's say you buy one kilogram of flour, and the recipe calls for 250 grams. So you've got 250 grams per recipe, you've got one kilogram of flour, so you can run four experiments from one bag of flour, four experiments from the next bag of flour. There is an effect that you can control. You can control how you allocate the first four experiments to the first bag and the next four experiments, but you have no idea to measure the effect of that flower on the experiment. Okay, what you can do in that, that example, in the recipe example, is you can mix both bags of flour up. Okay. So that the effect of flour has no impact on your why. But it's, in many processes, you, you actually cannot do that. There's, there's examples of, of a company, uh, raw materials system that I work with. You cannot pick the order of the raw materials. All you can pick is just the order of your experiments. Okay. So what this topic here looks at is what we call blocking. And blocking is simply just another way of saying pairing. We were pairing earlier on that's just blocking in the sky. So let's just put a quick look at blocking if we found it conceptually and then we'll pick it up again. Blocking if we found it simply says that when you allocate your experiments, let's say you take these eight experiments and you have to do them in two batches. So you do four experiments one day, four experiments the next day. You don't do the first four experiments in a row on one day and the next four experiments on the other day. We already know that well enough that that's a bad thing. But what we will do is we go and choose the experiments on day one to all have negative signs of A, B, and C, and we choose all experiments on day two to have positive signs of A, B, and C. That looks familiar, right? We saw that earlier in this course on R fractions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is leave that for you. Know, I'd like you to perhaps read this next slide and the one after it. Decode what that, what that kind of symbol, symbology means. We'll pick it up next time and we'll start to wrap up this